I have just a few announcements this morning. It is indeed very good to be back after such a long absence. Sister Tessa Woods sent this out a couple of days ago. Please become a victim. The Remnant Church of Jesus Christ in conjunction with the City of Independence Emergency Operations Center will have a disaster drill October 16th, 2021 at 7.0. 9 West Maple, which is the center congregation side of the building. Meet at that congregation, meet at that building at 4 o'clock to receive instructions and injury assignments. It's going to be a drill. And all ages and mobility types are invited to come. This is the first time that the EOC has been able to plan an exercise like this in 15 years, so let's make it a good one for them. There will be a seminar Tuesday evening, October 26, 7 o'clock here in this building to discuss the changes to Medicare. And this is going to be an important meeting, so those of you that are, like myself, involved in Medicare uh, need to be here, 7 o'clock. Invite you this afternoon at 6 o'clock. I believe it's Apostle Ralph Damon will be the speaker. Invite all to come out for that. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to look out there and see all your happy faces this morning. It is a beautiful day that the Lord has given each one of us. I have uh, make another announcement. This can you guys hear me? Okay. You want me to start shouting? I can do that. <laughs> also, for your remembrance, that this coming Saturday at two o'clock will be the memorial service for Brian Williams. So I um, wanted to put that on your radar for this weekend. I uh, welcome each one of you here this day in the name of Jesus Christ. My brother that is to speak this morning is one that's very fond upon my heart. He's... Um, birthday boy too two days ago so I just found that out last week so happy birthday Pete Pete has we have known the Potentlers for probably 30 35 years we've enjoyed their ministry and I have to say about seven or eight years ago brother Pete called me out of the blue one day and had a scripture to share with me, and it touched my heart listening to that scripture, for I feel the patriarchs are the fathers to the church. And so when I heard his, his words and, and followed along where he um, wanted to go, it brought tears to my eyes, and they, they stained the page that I was reading from. Um, I was going to ask Pete back there how many blessings that he's given, and holding the, the office of a patriarch, if you've considered getting your blessing, I would say to think of that more and maybe see Pete later on or uh, in the days to come. A patriarchal blessing, for those that may not know, is kind of a guide to a life. Would that be accurate, close? It's something that you can always take and pull out of your dresser and, and look and say, well, I never saw that part before. And that's what a patriarchal blessing is and will do. I would like to um, share with you the men that also share this day. My brother, William Hoover, who will be bringing the invocation. My brother, Ken Bird, will be bringing the benediction and I am presiding and my name is Bruce Terry if we can be called to worship we'll be reading out of the book of Enos and I know a couple of weeks I challenged everyone to read the book of Enos and I hope everyone has but out of the book of Enos with today's theme being remain strong in your testimony and faith 
And there came a voice unto me, saying, Enos, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou shalt be blessed. And I, Enos, knew that God could not lie. Wherefore, my guilt was swept away. And I said, Lord, how is it done? And he said unto me, Because of thy faith in Christ, whom thou hast never before heard nor seen, the faith of this man of going into the woods and praying all day on a bended knee, and when the night came, he continued on bended knee, praying to the Lord. And because of that faith, the Lord looked upon him and looked upon his heart, and he spoke to him. If any one of us would like to hear the Lord speaking, I would suggest that we might do that. For it takes a lot of faith to be able to stay all day and part night on a bended knee. The other announcement that I wanted to, and I forgot to, but right after Pete's scripture reading, we've had the beautiful music of Cheryl, and she will bring that to us today. If you will, let us be open our hymns to 210, and we'll stand and we'll sing this. Two one zero. Would you stand, please? Our Heavenly Father, uh, 
Holy Ghost, with your power. We pray, Father, that you would enter into the service and you would reach out to our people. It does us no good, Father, to come to church and not feel your spirit. We want your spirit to touch every soul here. And gracious Lord, we ask that we might keep our eyes single upon your son, for we see in these latter days that all things seems to be aimed at us. And we pray, Father, that we might put on our armor and that we might fight against those things that is unclean. So be with us today, Father. Be with our brother Pete as he gives a spoken word. Be with Bruce Terry. Let the power of the Holy Ghost be used in him. So, Father, minister to everyone here, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you bow with me? Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, we once again humble ourselves before you. Thank you for the opportunity for us to be here and to be able to give back. We know that you continually watch over each one of us, even with that hedge of protection so I ask this day, my Lord, would you continue to be with us in that chaos that seems to go around not only our country, but around the world, even as a mist of darkness. Help us be able to fight through and see and hang on to that rod of iron. Bless those that are able to give. Bless those who would share, be able to give. And we humbly ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
The scripture that I'm going to uh, share with you this morning is found from the testimony of Mark, the 8th chapter, the 36th through 41st verse. These are words of Jesus. Always the words of Jesus carry uh, good guidance for our lives. And this scripture uh, has in it good guidance and thought-provoking insights how that we might uh, live in harmony what God wants us to live and he reveals through his son. And when he, that's Jesus, had called his people with his disciples, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life, so he lose it. Or whosoever will save his life shall be willing to lay it down for my sake. And if he is not willing to lay it down for my sake, he shall lose it. But whosoever shall be willing to lose his life for my sake and the gospel, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Therefore, deny yourself of these and be not ashamed of me. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. desperation without hope walked the shell of a man then a hand with nail print stretched downward just one touch then a new life began and the old rugged cross made the difference in a life bound for heartache and defeat. I will praise him forever and ever for the cross made the difference for me. Barren walls echoed harshness and anger. Little feet ran in terror to hide. Now those walls ring with love, warmth, and laughter. Since the giver of life moved inside And the old rugged cross made the difference In a life bound for heartache and defeat I will praise him forever and ever 
for the cross made the difference for me there's a room filled with sad ashen faces without hope death has wrapped them in gloom but at the side of a saint there's rejoicing for life can't be sealed in a tomb and the old rugged cross made the difference in a life bound for heartache and defeat I will praise him forever and ever for the cross made the difference for me. In the scripture reading that I shared with you this morning, the key thing that Jesus is asking of each one of us is found in two very simple yet profound words, follow me. There has never, there never has or ever will be a greater or more meaningful invitation extended to any of us, or to the whole world for that matter, than those simple words, follow me. And when I look out upon the congregation this morning, I see brothers and sisters in Christ, and I see people who, who respond to the invitation of Jesus to follow him. And that's why we're here this morning. This invitation comes a very, from a very good source. It comes from the Son of God. And he is asking those who choose to follow him to give him their entire life, just as he gave his life in doing the will of his Father. And he gave his life for each of us, for our salvation, that we might enjoy immortality and eternal life in the kingdom of God. What it requires of those who would follow him is to come and hear him, come to him in prayer that we might draw near to him and that he might draw near to them. He asks us to study his word, which is his gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God he calls us to be obedient, obedient to the commandments that he gives us, and he promised his Holy Spirit will always be with us. He gives them for our guidance, for our protection. And he gives them that we might have quickens in our hearts the desires to follow and try to do his will on earth in this opportunity that we have, that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus began his ministry, he, cho he chose a small group of faithful and trusted men to preach his gospel after he would no longer be with them when it was necessary for him to return to his heavenly father. Jesus would teach the gospel of love and mercy and faith and repentance and forgiveness 
and obedience. And this was quite different than what the narrow-minded narrow -minded religious and religious leaders of his day. I've often wondered what kind of man that Jesus was. What kind of a personality could convince men to follow him just by asking? The Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus looked like, but I think of him as being a, a man of strength, probably suntan from walking in the desert sun. And I think of his eyes being full of kindness. And when he looked into your eyes, he seemed to know you and to see into your very soul. And I believe he had a touch of humor in the messages, the message that he would bring to us. When he called Peter and Andrew, who were fishermen, who I'm sure loved his work, because many of us love to go fishing. But when he said to him, follow me, the scriptures say, they straightway left their nets and followed him. When he invited Matthew, who was very rich and not a very popular profession of being a tax collector, Matthew arose and followed him. And these and all of his disciples that he chose, their lives were never the same again. And this is faithful, or this is true of all faithful disciples. What he said to these first disciples, he says to us today. So he would say to you, to follow me. And he would say, if any man or woman would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus is calling faithful and trusted disciples to follow him today, to guide his church in these uncertain and chaotic times, to establish his will and his kingdom on earth. Where his will is done on earth and is this done in heaven to pray for his return. Oftentimes we kind of go past that last part to pray for his return. But that's very important because that's a part of what our preparation here that we are doing. And we look forward to that glorious day for his return. And we want to be worthy to greet him. You know, if somebody would come and ask you to follow me, you would like to know where he's going and maybe have him give some directions on how to get there. Jesus said that he is the way the truth, and the life. He is the light to guide our way. He guides us past self-centeredness. He says to die yourself. He guides us to be God-centered, to be righteous. And that means he wants us to be right with him, and he wants us to be right with each other. Jesus gives us some wonder, wonderful guidance for our day. It's found in Doctrine and Covenants, the fourth section. It was revealed through revelation through the prophet of the church. These words are words of Jesus, which, which uh, invite us to pay close attention to them. Now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth amongst the children of men. Therefore, 
O oh, you that bark, that embark on the service of God, see that you serve him with all of your heart, your might, your mind, and your strength, that you may stand blameless before God in the last day. Therefore, if you have desires to serve God, there's that key word, desires, desires to serve God, you are called to the work. For behold, the field is white, all ready to harvest. And lo, he that thrusts in his sickle with his might, the same layeth up in store that he perish not, but bringeth salvation to his soul. And faith, oh, these are the one, one these are wonderful kingdom qualities, goes on. And faith, hope, charity, and love, with an eye single to the glory of God, qualifies him for the work. Remember, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, and diligence. Ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be open unto you. Amen. When I was at Graceland, I took every course I could under uh, Ray Zinzer, who's a wonderful teacher, and uh, I think one of the best preachers of the gospel, and especially insights on, on Zion and the kingdom of God. And I still have a book that, that he wrote, and he wrote a nice little when he signed it, a nice little message to me. I cherish it. Uh, and here's what he said. He told us, the class I was in. He said, every one of you should write this revelation on a little three-by-five card and keep it with you. And I did that. I appreciate that we have the blessing of having good, wise men who have written books and given us instructions, restoration instructions to help guide us. Because I'm probably not the smartest man, but I am blessed with being able to read and to study. And in doing that, it helps me to understand so that I'll be able to share with you and to share, share together. God has given his church direction in these latter days. In 1829, a young boy of 14 went into a, a wooded grove near his home in Palmyra, New York, to pray and to ask God for wisdom and divine guidance. There he was given a vision and God revealed himself through the power of revelation and he gave young Joseph this direction. Here's direction from God again. This is my beloved son, hear him. Joseph learned that he must pray and to listen in order to hear and obey. This is also our direction, very simple, Few words, but profound. Hear him. It is important to understand why Christ established his church in order to bring to pass this great and marvelous work that was mentioned in our previous scripture. It's found in the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter of the sixth verse. Very important to the restoration movement. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The Restoration Church that came into being is a fulfillment of this prophecy. 
When Jesus first established his church, he needed faithful and trusted disciples to bring to pass the will of his Father through them. So he called priesthood, and he gave them the power and authority to administer the sacraments and ordinances of the church, where the power of godliness is made manifest and to restore his gospel and work. It's important that we gather together and share in the ordinance of preaching, to share in the beauty of prayer and testimony services. He restored his gospel so that his followers could become adopted sons and daughters of God through the terms of the gospel of Christ. He created mankind to have eternal life and to be with him in eternity in the kingdom of God. We are not only required to know the gospel and its eternal principles, but to do what they require of us. The eternal call of Christ and his restored church is to repent and be baptized for the remissions of your sins by water and baptized and endowed with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why the church and the loving fellowship of the saints is so important. When we as a people live in obedience to his word, which is his gospel, we become his disciples. A disciple is one who follows Jesus and follow what he asks of us. He has admonished us to gather and meet together often and worship and share together the good news of the gospel in spiritual fellowship that we might gain that we might grow spiritually and to help each other grow in the image of Jesus if we would become more spiritual it's important that we gather amongst spiritual minded people where the Lord can bless us with that spirit to bring our children so that they get the feel of what it feels like to be in the in the sweet quiet assurance of the Holy Spirit this is why attending the service of the church is very important because there is ministry in attendance and when that thought came to me when I was preparing and, and writing my notes that jumped out at me there is ministry in attendance. We minister to and through each other. This prepares us for living in God's kingdom. And we become living testimonies of godliness. And this godliness reflected in our lives can influence others to become his disciples and respond to the invitation to follow him. And this is what the Lord asks us to do. This gospel of the kingdom is not only for us, but it's for all mankind. And he is, God has entrusted into his church to be his disciples, to spread this good news and invite and inspire others to come and join and receive the blessings that come from clo living close to our Heavenly Father. When I was a boy, I attended a pre-baptismal class that stressed how important it was to know the principles of the gospel of Jesus. And I wanted to do good, so I memorized them. Their faith, repentance, baptisms, laying on of hands, the resurrection and eternal judgment. And I thought, boy, 
I passed that test, I guess, the class. I got them memories. So now I know what the principles of the Gospels are. But as I tried to live up to my baptismal covenant, these principles took on more meaning than just memorizing them. As I mentioned earlier, we've been blessed with wise men that we can learn from through preaching or writings. And I found this in a, in a sermon by Apostle W.E. Timms. And it really opened my eyes to more meaning of what these principles of the gospel mean. I'm going to quote him. I'm going to share them with you because it meant so much to me. So I'm going to quote him. I quote, first, we need to have a desire. There's that word again. So we're going to stress we're going to have a desire for many things, I hope, when we leave this service. First, we need to have a desire that will lead us to a sense of purpose. And from that desire, we progress to a position where we have faith. And as God meaningfully comes into focus in our thinking, faith. Then as that faith becomes evident in our lives, we are made more aware of our sinfulness. Then comes repentance. And it is at this point that we are called to go through the ordinance of baptism which symbolically represents our willingness to become new people. We bury the old and arise new creatures. Isn't that the feeling that we had and we see others have when they make this wonderful step, whether they be eight years old or 80? The focus of Jesus' ministry has always been on the kingdom of God. When disciples, his disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, this is what he taught them. He said, pray thy, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is Zion on earth. We as a people have been admonished to gather to the center place and begin the process of establishing Zion and preparing for the return of Jesus. Zion and preparing for the return of Jesus. He must have a place to return to in order to be the head of his church and rushing in the 1,000 year millennial reign when Satan will be bound and the Lord Jesus will reign with the righteous saints that have gone before us. And this will be a time of perfecting, perfecting of the saints, so that they can return to the full presence of the Father and the Son and all the saints that have gone before. And a perfecting us of perfecting us in understanding all of his laws. I believe this will be celestial glory. This is why we need the gospel of Christ to bring to pass Zion. And this is why we need Zion to prepare for his return. This thing is the best thing we can ever do for our children, to have them to be a part of this great work. We take care of them with vitamins and all the things that we provide for them, all their physical needs that mothers and dads provide for their children. But this is the most important thing we can do for our children, to have them be a part of this great and marvelous work that's going to prepare them for eternity with God. I've seen this at work. 
especially with parents with children. They bring them to church. Sometimes grandparents, parents, uncles bring children to church. I remember, I, I love when I watch, usually it's the women working with the children in the back. And what they're doing is wonderful ministry. Working with those children, teach them that they're loved, and teach them bits and pieces of the truth of the gospel. And let them be around people that are spiritually minded and are desiring to do the will of God. Now how do we know that Zion can even be? Well, I think it's true that something has, has been done in the past can be done again. And so I'm going to read from the book of Genesis 7.23, a very familiar scripture to all of you. It's about Zion. And the Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and they were of one mind and they dwelled in righteousness. And there were no poor among them. What does this mean? One heart means to feel like God. God was full of love. His great commandments were based on love. Probably all of his ministry is based on love. That's what he was like. One heart means to feel like God. One mind is to think like God. When we pray, we've been promised, when we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus and pray with faith believing, it says all things will be added unto us, the things that are important. So to think like God, we will think about his kingdom and why and how we have a part in it and how blessed we are out of the billions and billions of people on the earth, such a small percentage of remnant saints to carry out this great work. We can't do it by ourselves, so we have to have, we have, to have God with us in order to have, get it done, and we can. And if we feel and think like God, this is what his dwelling in righteousness means. And no poor among them is because our love for one another as disciples of Christ, it will be our nature to care for one another. Zion, or the kingdom of God, is a kingdom of brothers and sisters because they are the children of God, because they love each other. And he invites all to follow him and keep the commandments as he has given them. God's desire is that his children, that's us, become like his son Jesus and to share eternal life with those who are of one heart and one mind and dwell in righteousness. He wants this to be the desire of our hearts. to share in eternal life with those who are, who are of one heart and one mind and dwell in righteousness. In closing, I'm going to read two scriptures that I, that I think will give guidance. I want you to kind of think about them as we go about your daily life. They're not very long, but they're insightful. The verse is, I think, one of the most beautiful of all scriptures, and I've just taken a part of it. It's from the prologue to the Gospel of John, the first chapter, the first verse. In the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son, and the gospel was the Word, and the Word was with the Son. And the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. 
The second scripture is taken from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew 6, chapter, the 38th verse. Therefore, seek not the things of this world, but first seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness. And all these things of life shall be added, all these things shall be added unto you. All the good that we hope to be, God has promised through his son, it shall be. It's good to be in the company of the saints. And I would pray that the Lord would bless and keep each one of you in his love. And I would pray that his Holy Spirit will be your guiding light to keep you to remember your baptismal covenant, the promises that you made, and the desires of your heart that will well up inside you when you know that you're doing your best to do this, the will of God. And all these good things, your life, your marriage, your family, your friends, especially your faithful fellowship amongst the faithful people will be added unto you. May he bless you as his disciples to bring to pass his holy purposes because that's what you are, disciples of Jesus. And this is my prayer and hope for you let nothing separate you from each other. And the work on which you each have been called, which has helped to bring to pass the kingdom of God on earth. And this is my prayer for each of you. Thank you, Brother Pete. Appreciate those words. Also, I'd like to thank Linda, who's been playing the piano for us today, and Sister Cheryl. The, the music that you sang was beautiful. We will close with hymn 72. May the Lord be with each one today. Almighty God, our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we have assembled in thy house of worship this day, and we have come, Heavenly Father, under the presence of thy Spirit, and we're grateful, Lord, that we've had this privilege and this opportunity to once again hear thy word from this pulpit. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word that our brother has brought to us this day. 
It is words of encouragement, words of promise, and we're grateful unto your son Jesus for bringing those words to us, Lord. Be with us this day and the rest of this day, Lord, that we might be able to continue worship until our next meeting. And be with each in spirit, Lord, that we might look upon thee of every minute of our time, that we may be always in a worshipful attitude, Lord, that we may bring about those purposes that we have been given to bring about here upon this earth. So bless us, Heavenly Father, as we leave. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.